perfect, Cute. perfect, perfect. So yeah, if not, we'll get stuck in. So Brittany, thank Good. you so much for coming on. Um, yeah. Oh, so welcome. Don't stress, but um, yeah, I'd just love to start with your beginning because it's so cool. Like, yeah, talk me through it at the time. 23, you've got your life savings invested and then yeah, a pink shipping container in Northbridge. Hey. So like, how did it start? Um, so basically, like very, very long story short, I had um, a poodle called Pebbles and she's the love of my life. Um, and we've been together since she was seven. Um, she passed away in 2020. Good innings. She was 20 years old though. Oh, really? um, yeah, I know. Crazy. And so she's not very mobile. So she did not, you know, she wasn't going to move with me to Melbourne or Sydney or America or wherever it is that I needed to go for work. So I was like, I'm going to start my own company. So background, I'm, I work in branding. So I did studied graphic design, photography. I did commercial photography for ages, um, brand designing, all those kinds of things. And then um, it kind of got to the point where it was like, you know, I can continue to do uh, what everyone else wants me to do. And generally speaking, when you're my age, or well, the age I was, you, clients give you something and then they're like, hey, can you copy this is essentially what they're asking you to do. Hmm. Um, and it becomes very tedious and boring. And then you give them these baller ideas and they're like, oh, wow, that's so great. And you're like, couldn't you have trusted me in the first place? And I was, yeah, boring of that rhetoric. But also um, I live in Perth, Same a lot raised born South Africa but raised here um and then it was like hey best opportunities are in Melbourne Sydney or the states if you want to work on the kind of work you want to work on like I love startups like that was particularly interesting to me um like youth fashion lifestyle that kind of area and then again the dog she's not moving so I was like fine we <laughs> we will just go ahead and make our own business why the why the fuck not um and it was such a fun exercise in doing whatever it is that I wanted to do. So often people always like, why all the pink? Uh, that's why, because why the fuck not? Jack, mm. I just want to do what I want to do. Um, and I also had a friend called Mallory and we used to work together at a pretzel place when we were kids. So she loves pretzels like she's obsessed with them. Um, and she always wanted to own one. But the one that we worked at, um, run by the most lovely people, uh, but they were getting older, didn't want to renew the lease, shut it down, essentially. So there was no pretzel place for Mallory. And she was kind of my target. I was like, hey, I will design this thing. I will brand it. I will make it. And I'll sell it to her and her dad, who was actually looking at the time. Um but then she fell in love with a boy from Canada, well, a Perth boy who's in Canada. So that didn't that didn't go so well. But um, by that stage, I had pretzel and and it was the worst six months of my existence, but the best thing I've ever done. Like I could not. It's the thing I'm most proud of. Like I probably mm. sounds very strange to be like I had the best time having the worst time, but yeah. we just got so popular so quickly, and I was the only person who who knew how to do it. So I was in there 19 hours a day rolling pretzels for a whole year. Wow. Um, yeah, it was insane. But that's sort of how it all got started. Very like generic, like not generic, very like genuine. It was like one thing led to another thing that led to another thing. Really wasn't this like big masterminded, you know, plan. Mm. It just was what it was. Oh, so when did you quit your brand job or the full time? Like, did you just go, yeah, head first into the yeah. world? Or? So I was freelancing um, majority um, and I had some clients that I work with regularly, but realistically speaking, I pretty much cut ties with them uh, 2017 in like the middle of the year. Then I went to America for a bit, um, holidays, those kinds of things, did some work, then, you know, finished up the year and started working on pretzel and just committed full time to doing that. Was doing hospital in the meantime, worked as a waitress. Um, I used to have like thousands of jobs. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just like to work and I like to be busy. So mm. I was doing a crap ton of things, um, which, you know, all provided that hundred thousand dollar income yeah. that I could then, you know, squish into pretzel. Was there ever a moment in time where you thought, okay, I'm really onto something here. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. When did you, or did you, have you ever reached that point still, or I don't know, like, um, yeah, no, look, it's so funny because like others' perception of me is very different to my perception of me. Like I'm just an idiot rolling around doing what she wants to do kind of thing. Um, but there is this like, you know, thought that I've like, you know, 
they're like, oh, she's this big CEO of this multi-million dollar company. Um, and I'm like, yeah, no, not really. Um, so I suppose like those moments don't happen for me often. I'm not like, fuck, well, look <laughs> at that. You done did a thing. Um, but every now and again, I'll be like, hey, that's pretty cool. You yeah. did a thing. But it was pretty obvious pretty quickly that we were going to be super popular. Mm. Um, and that that was an issue and a blessing. But also we were never designed to be so busy. Like the biggest issue in our company, which we have almost resolved, is um, the wait time. Mm. So, you know, we have this tiny, weeny little 16-foot shipping container. I What? How am I supposed to produce? You know, we had lines coming out of the freaking all the way past James Street cul-de-sac. Like it was crazy. And the expectation that we function like McDonald's was pretty <laughs> high. And I'm like, hey, just me making the dough, rolling them out, cooking them. It is bread. Um, and then when we try to fix that, that problem, like there is millions and millions, and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment put into equipment for pizza and burgers and whatever. Mm. Um, but, you know, the only person who does pretzels to my level is me. Yeah. So you need a fair bit of capital to be able to start investing in creating custom machines which we now have um so that we can speed up the process so yeah it's like sort of at that point when I was like fuck we're kind of onto something but also fuck this is this is this is gonna be a little bit of work (laughs) um it's fuck tons of work still still is yeah and that's what I mean you guys often doing small spaces like even the manager forum one I've been to and same thing like you guys are getting it done a small space made to order unreal yeah, I mean, it's part of like the business sort of like genius, <laughs> which, you know, do if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, even like Northbridge, when we moved in there, there were like so many people come up to me when I was working there that whole year. And they're like, how did you get this spot? I'm like, I'm irritating. Like, I'm just irritating. And I would call the council. I'm like, hey, hi, who can I speak to? And They just kept presenting me with like, oh, there's no water connection. So I fixed that problem. I was like, we can do an IBC tank pump out. They're like, fuck, okay, she's got a point. (laughs) And then they're like, what about the power? I'm like, oh, Fringe Festival's in there. I know you've got power. They're like, oh, fuck. Um, Then they were like, how? How though? You know, you can't just put four walls and a a concrete slab down. I was like, no, no, I can. Shipping Mm -hmm. container. So, you know, I mean, like, it's always just worked out of this like very like problem solvey kind of like manner, I suppose you could call mm. it. Um, and so like small spaces were low money. If you're yeah. trying to, you know, rent out from a center group or something, which they own Westfield, mm. um, you know, a huge space with all this seating space. I mean, that's awesome, but <laughs> it costs money. Yeah. Whereas 16 square, you know, with a little shipping container in a pokey little spot that no one, you know, wasn't making the city council any rent. Mm. But, you know, I could say, hey, you make zero dollars on those 20 tiles. How about I give you some cash? That's better than nothing. And then, you know, they were like, sure. So we, you know, you can get a good deal that way um, and make it viable to to run a business and start it, which is 100,000. Yeah. I'm curious for your sort of optics on this because obviously you're in the business, you know it. But same thing with small spaces, especially for food and beverage. Like me as a consumer, I like the small spaces because it always seems like a bit more cozy, but obviously in terms of busyness too as well. Like if you have a big space and it's pretty empty, it kind of looks bad. Whereas if you guys have a small space, is that better? Is that something you notice or plays towards? Yes, for sure. Um, But then also like on the flip side, it can be really a turnoff. You're like, fuck, I'm never going to be able to sit down. Mm. I'm not going to be able to like find anywhere to be. Um, and it depends also like if you're destinational or like takeaway. Mm. So if you're, you know, really just aiming for that takeaway market, cool beans, yeah, pick it up, go see you later, ideal. Um, but if you do want people to be able to like meet there or like, you know, you need some space and to be competitive, you know, like. So we are like, we're quite competitive for Centuros or whatever. Mm. So if you look over at Pretzel or the tables are full, they'll hop on over to Centuros because they're like, you know yeah. what? Fuck it. I, I want to sit. I came here to hang out with my friends. So it's considering your consumer and like Northbridge works really well for us because there's so much space around Yes, like benches we've got out there. We can have umbrellas. Like that's all cool. Um, but our production space is really small and that's really what we pay for. 
So it depends, but I do like the little vibes. Like yeah. the vibes are cool. I enjoy yeah. that. And oh. I think also you can do more like from a monetary perspective. Like I fucking love high ceilings. Finance guys hate high ceilings. <laughs> Because if you are paying, you know, like, I don't know, $600 a square meter, you just added a whole bunch of square meters. Yeah. When you can throw in a ceiling, like such a big misconception is that it's cheaper to have an exposed ceiling. Hmm, really? No fucking way is that cheaper. Absolutely never is. If you see an exposed ceiling out there, you appreciate it, please. They've coughed up for it. Honestly, because if you throw a ceiling in, See you later. Everything up there can be ugly as. Yeah. Whereas if, you know, you want to make it sprayed out and like pretty, that costs dollars. Oh, interesting. Okay. Did not know. It's a tangent. Um, you and I will be tangenting a lot, by the that, way. <laughs> that's fine. That's the beauty of it. I love it. <laughs> um, And yeah, with the business, especially early on, like you said, you were a bit surprised, demand driven. Was that through social media, uh, Instagram? Like you want to talk about that? Yeah. So like we just recently had our Instagram stolen. Ooh. Um, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So it was like a contract killing is what they call it, mm. um, which basically means that someone out there didn't want us to have that. So um, when we got hacked, we ended up, we got our hackers in and then they, not that I have hackers on standby, but we <laughs> this. yeah, for these kinds of purposes, yeah. um, we spoke to them and I was like, who's in there? How do we get it back? Um, they contacted them and then they basically, we were like, how much? What do you want? Like, that's usually what you expect that exchange to be. Um, and they were like, nothing, we've already been paid. So oh. I was like, what do you mean? Who paid you? They're like, well, we're not going to tell you who paid you, but moral of the story is that was our job. We were yeah. there to get rid of it. And in that day and age, Instagram was I like a quick tangent. There's a thing called the millennial tax. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you've noticed, but like Uber used to be like super affordable and now it is the same price as taxis. Mm-hmm. Airbnb used to be super affordable and now it is just as expensive, if not more expensive than a hotel. So those companies, as far as my understanding goes, is that they had to report a growth model for the first 10 years of their business's life. So to their shareholders, they were saying, we are growing, but making money was not necessarily the objective there because they had a growth strategy. You know, all those like $15 off your Uber Eats, whatever. Yeah. So like they could demonstrate that they were growing this community of users. At 10 years or whatever, the assumption is here is that then they switch to a profit model. So like, okay, now our shareholders want to see some returns. We want money. But they fucking, they got us. They got us all. We How do we live without any of those services? We do not. Mm. So it's perfect for them. Um, but my assumption is that Instagram had a similar model. And for a very long time, they made it good for businesses to be on Instagram and really easy for them to appear on Instagram. And the only objective was to have really high quality, good content. Reason being that we all then contributed to the value of Instagram's app. We, businesses, influencers, whatever, added the value. So it's genius business model from their their end. Um, But then, same thing. They wanted to switch from just having a growth model and saying, hey, we've got this many users on the platform to, hey, we have this many businesses that are paying for views Mm. so you know the common you could probably hear it every now and again everyone's like oh i've got you know sixty thousand followers but only like two people comment Mm -hmm. because instagram is limiting yes instagram is limiting how many people are going to see your content based on how much money you've given them Mm. if you are not giving them money you are not getting anything unless you're an influencer in which case their algorithm crawls for and the influencer quote unquote is the um bread and butter of their industry so they promote the influencers in order to keep that business model viable um, and then they continue to charge businesses for views however as a business person in this year 2023 that's a gamble Um, and most business people do not like to gamble we like short things so or as close to a short thing as you can get so you know we started off with instagram and that's how we took off and we were like really really big from that perspective on Instagram, quote unquote big, like, I mean, we weren't, you know, but we did very well and we had a really, really high engagement rate and they were all really genuine local customers um, to now having absolutely no Instagram whatsoever that reaches minimal to no people. So it's, you know, really what launched us, but in the whole process of losing that Instagram, which is why I'm telling you this. (laughs) No, no, perfect. 
is that um, we we kind of learned that our in-store sort of experience and it being shared on other people's social medias is actually more important than us having our own social media that, you know, that gets referred to. Um, and yeah, it was a really, really big contributor to launching our business, but we also had loads of interest from just like popular publications like Perth Now and you know, magazines and, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's a cool thing. Like it's a random fat, big pink shipping container in the middle of the city. It's, you know, it's noteworthy. Yeah. But going forward, like we're really like re-strategizing how we approach all of that and we have like this really cool campaign coming up called see you in the real world Mm -hmm. and like we're moving all of our budget from online to like real world experiences oh cool so we'd rather like engage with our customer in the actual world (laughs) and then have them post it up on their social medias do whatever the fuck they want with it Mm -hmm. then spend you know so much time money effort and you know stress creating an Instagram that, you know, will only ever gain three and a half followers a minute. Like, yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, it's just for no good reason. You know what I mean? Like they've liked your page. They want to see, but. Yeah. And if there was some kind of like, you know, guarantee behind the spend, that would be Mm. worth it. But then would that be Instagram? No, because, you know, then the biggest player wins and that's not fair and that's not organic and that's not how that should work. So you know, it just sucks. Like if you're an individual, great. Instagram's awesome. Um, But if you're a business, it's just, it's not the same as it was five years ago. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Do you want to talk? Can you talk about the upcoming See You in the Real World? Anything about that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Well, I can tell you some bits of info. So we basically, we've put together like a website. Um, It says See You in the Real World. Um, dot com dot au and it's in beta phase at the moment. So uh, we have a team of people in Melbourne and in WA who are like, going around and doing all these crazy things. Um, But one of them is we've got a bunch of ducks. So um, I think it's like 2,000 pink ducks. And they have a little QR code on them. Mm -hmm. And we are going to like release them to the public. So I think there's a tram, a Melbourne tram that's going to get filled with them. A bunch of places in Perth have sort of jumped on board and they all have our little duckies. Um, And the idea is that you get the duck, you bring the duck in, you get a free pretzel. You bring the duck back in so that we can recycle the duck Mm. so that we can take the duck back out again so we can go and see new people. Um, And the whole idea is to just like, that's what pretzel is about. It's like fun. It's supposed to be an interruption of fun. It's not got any, so often people like, so what does your business, what problem does it solve? I'm like, none of them. Absolutely not one of the problems. No, it's not for that. Mm. It's, it's carbs and sugar and a good time. That's it. Like, that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, when we started Instagram, we got to have more of that fun and we got to like speak to our customer more often and engage and like be funny. And like when COVID hit or whatever, like, you know, the toilet paper thing, mm. like we were like, oh, every pretzel comes with a napkin. <laughs> like, you know, we got to do fun stuff like that and really get engagement, which is the fun part. But now that that's not possible, where, you know, running around the city and randomly getting on your morning tram and there's 2,000 ducks in there, like, that's so fun. Like, we just want to communicate how we are as a bunch of people. It's like, we just do this for shits and giggles. We genuinely do. And we just want to have a good time. We want our customers to have a good time. We want to make everything pink and do fun things like that. So... We also have like big billboard or whatever that's going up that's kind of funny, but I can't really tell you too much more about that one. That's fine. We've got, um, yeah, like a whole bunch of very random, but very cool. And we're doing an unhappy meal as well. Ooh. Yeah, which is like, it's like a four pretzel um, set in like a pink unhappy meal looking thing. (laughs) Please don't sue me, McDonald's, but we'll see. (laughs) I was going to ask about the litigation side of it. I was like, I don't even want to bring it up. (laughs) I don't really know how that would go down, but I'm willing to find out. That's fine. That's cool. That's where the fun is anyway. (laughs) I mean, yeah, honestly, if someone from McDonald's calls me, I'd be just on it. I'd be like, wow, God, great. Please don't sue me though. Like, Didn't think we'd get to this point. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So how do you find juggling then Melbourne and Perth and then why make the expansion from Perth to Melbourne? Um, So... Juggling, whoa, super difficult over COVID. Yeah, like that was hard. That was tough. And like, our, to be honest, our Victorian stores were a pile of shit. Like 
it did not work well. It was not going well um, because there's such a high level of training involved mm. um, in Petzl. And we opened two weeks before COVID started. Wow. Just two weeks. So, and we had five stores signed on. So five stores wow. opened over two years into the world's worst pandemic ever. Um, and when you're dealing with that kind of stuff, like I didn't want to shut my stores for a singular day because I have responsibilities. Like my kids come to work every single day. My kids are my staff, by the way. I don't have them. <laughs> um, you know, they come to work every single day and that's their job. And, you know, my job is to provide them a place to go to work. So, you know, we copped a fuck lot of monetary losses and took some real hard hits to make sure that everyone could continue to pay their bills. But you know, the climate at the time wasn't so, you know, communally favorable. I think everyone was like freaking out about their own situation. Hiring became difficult. Staff started just, you know, wondering where they can get, you know, the next job keeper or whatever. And yeah. I think, yeah, it was a floundering time for everyone where a few morals just were thrown out the window and we physically couldn't get over. I physically could not leave. So, you know, how much like Zoom training is really not not how it is um yeah and those like my yeah my staff were put in an awkward position and we had some really terrible management step in who was like you know low-key frauding us but yeah yeah these all mm. things happen when you can't get to the freaking place that your stores are yeah um, builds became really difficult like you know a build that would take four weeks was taken six months because of material issues it was oh, shit show um <laughs> but <laughs> it is what it is you kind of have to roll from there. Um, but, you know, like we suffered some serious reputational damage. Like, you know, people come in and be like, that took like, you know, 40 minutes and it was the world's worst pretzel. Um, and that is hospo. It mm-hmm. is. You know what I mean? And it is business. Like you don't always get it right. And and that was a very untraveled path. Like we didn't really know how to handle it. And had I had my time over, I would have put myself in Victoria and I would have stayed there. Yeah. Wouldn't have stayed there. But you know, the headspace at that time was, you know, if we're going to have to keep all these kids employed casually, I'm going to have to do a lot of the work. So we basically, instead of hiring on new things, like I was copying those jobs. So Mm. I was working around the clock, 24 hours a day, just about trying to pick up the slack. And it's not possible to do that away from the headquarters. So, but yeah, it's all within, you know, what's it called it? when you hindsight or with hindsight yeah 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 yeah. but um we basically when the borders opened we sent like seven or eight or nine pretzel kids from wa over to victoria um and we put them up there in accommodation and they just like had the time of their lives doing pretzel things and and you know exploring melbourne you know how perth people in melbourne we get oh yeah (laughs) um yeah and then we managed to from there really start them all up again properly but that was five stores all at once from you know really not functioning to doing a really good job so we're getting there but melbourne was i suppose we chose melbourne because like the most fun like Mm -hmm. we i kind of felt like they were like my people from like a fun perspective yeah it's like they really appreciate weird stuff new stuff interesting things and It's a bigger market space for sure. From a business perspective, we can have more stores. Perth, you do cap out at a certain, you know, there's only so many of us. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, you know, we're looking to expand to Brisbane pretty soon. So Adelaide, I have my eye on. Um, Is Singapore still in the works? Yes, Singapore is very much in the works. Um, Especially being on the same time zone as Perth and all that. Yeah. They are a little further behind in their COVID recovery than us, though. So it's still just like waiting for the right moment to do that one. Um, but Canberra's in the works. Sydney, I have no interest in. Um, <laughs> I love the honesty. Yeah, no, nah, they're not a grateful audience. Yeah. <laughs> they have too much. And I think that sometimes you've got too much and you've got too much choice. Makes you a little, little. Entitled. Yeah. Don't want to say it, but. Oh, happy to say it. Yeah, I think I just, it's not sensical for me to open something up that they will love for a year. Mm. And, you know, something. They're on to the next hot thing. Exactly. But, um, you know, maybe one day, Sydney, maybe. Mm. We'll see. We'll see some feedback and then we'll go from there. 
and because all your stores are owned and like operated by you, they're not. There's no franchise model, is there either? So no, nope. yeah. So they're all mine. Hence, you know, the COVID stress. Um, but we are. It's like so. I've had to sit myself down because oh. you know, being your own boss, occasionally you have to have weird conversations with yourself. It's like I sit on this side of the chair and then I move to the other. And I don't physically, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and I was like, this is not possible anymore. Like you're being silly now. It's not possible to continuously manage and run like I mean it's like I have 300 staff I have three other cafes like silly so we're getting stupid so um when moving to a type of franchise model mm-hmm. um I wouldn't call it that but apparently you know the franchise council of Australia would so I have to but um we want to supersede staff from the company mm. into owning them yes okay cool. so it provides like a little bit of like a pathway for them um and also some legitimacy to it like very, very often, and I'm sure other hospital people would so agree with me, um, hospital is like this in the meantime thing. Yes. And that's totally fine. That's totally fine. That is 99.9% of our hiring base. But I like, you know, I have a few gripes with the upcoming generation. Um, and I just think that, you know, if anyone's paying you for something, you, you got to do your best for mm. you. You know what I mean? Like have, have some loyalty, have some, you know, sense of pride, have, you know, I think a lot of the time they complain that like they, me, we, we're in the same generation. You know, we complain about all the bad things going on, but do not spend any time contributing to the good. Mm-hmm. And like, I fucking bust my ass every day. Like, because I want to see good things. Yeah. And I want like, that's what I want for my staff. I want like, you know, my staff to be like, hey, fuck, actually I'm coming here and I'm paid to do this job. And I want to like, no one else has the unique opportunity to make so many people happy. Like when you're in customer service, you just throw someone, hey, I like your glasses. Fuck, you just, they're so much happier. They have like yeah. the time of their life. And I'm like, what a unique opportunity. But all of these kids are like, you know, waiting for their next nine to five because that's a real job, quote unquote. And you're like, that doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, not to be funny, but make a fuck ton more money than a doctor. Yeah. So realistically speaking, if money was the goal, then hospice is real viable. And like, I have two kids who are my assistants, Knox and Harry. Fuck, they bust their asses and they're really, really good. Um, And they're young, right? Like young, young. Like Harry was like 19 a hot minute ago. Mm. Um, Knox is like 20, 23. So- Still young. And, yeah, very, very young. <laughs> so they could potentially, you know, by the time they're 24 and 25 odd, own, you know, own their own store or maybe two two or three or four and yes they are pretzel workers that is what they will tell people will they you know be more successful quote unquote than a than a doctor yeah Mm. but so it's like trying to educate my little babies on that's my kids (laughs) on being (laughs) you know like open to other opportunities and like you know doing things a different way just because you don't want to you know do it the same as everyone else doesn't mean it's any less valuable and like Mm. being a able to show them as the owner that yeah actually I will trust you if you can get through working in the store you've got like a strict set of requirements you have to work in the store for a minimum of a year supervise the store for a minimum of a year then you can own them yeah um you know then that's like you're yeah at 23 it's possible like it's possible to do that it's possible to be very successful it's possible to make a lot of money in hospital and it you know it does deserve the care and love and attention that people give their architect jobs or whatever it might be like Hmm. every job's an important one that's my feeling so that's sort of how we want to move forward into a franchise quote-unquote model um you know and we've also got some like cool systems and stuff in place where like the actual corporate company will be out of venture capital for them because Mm -hmm. obviously 23 you don't really just have around. (laughs) um so that way they can work towards paying it off, owning it, then they can use the funds from that one to purchase the second pretzel or mm. third pretzel. We can ensure the quality is much higher for our customers. Um, and it like works really well for everyone. Yeah, that's so cool. Because, yeah, I, I'm not, hospital is not my area of domain, but I always like looking at it because, like, yeah, you got to just go, fuck it, have a crack. Like, you could get stuck in, especially younger people too, and they try something new. Like, yeah, there's a lot of failures, but it's like you get some, like, fucking out-of-the-park home runs. Yeah. And also that's like such an interesting concept that they like resilience is very low in our group of, you know, what do you call us? Like a, like a generation. Mm. Um, and often like people, 
will like take words with really positive meanings and twist them in order to get themselves out of feeling a certain way. So like resilience is often at the moment being like used as like this almost gaslighting term. So it's like, oh, you know, you, you we need someone who's resilient in the workplace. And they'll be like, oh, they just want us to work 24 seven and da, 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 da. you're like, no, literally, I just, I just need you to bounce back quickly from failure. Yeah. That's what I'm just the dictionary definition. I don't know if that is, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm not trying to gaslight. I literally just mean you cannot do this job if you cannot say, hi, how are you? And have someone not say shit back to you. Do you know yes. what I mean? That's, you got to be resilient. Like if mm. that's going to make you cry, like just let like just let me know if you need anything. And like crickets, like we're talking bare basic. We're talking yeah. like my till girls, Like they need to be resilient. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, that sort of like, like need for those sorts of like redefinings of stuff that makes us feel better about not being our best. Mm. I think like has to sort of like go out the window so that we can make some room to like, like the sentiment is right. We yeah. want to have a better workspace. We want to have better working conditions and things like that, but earn them also yeah. and like have them be reasonable. So people stop calling us the snowflake generation. <laughs> but it's true. Like you can't appreciate the sunshine without a little rain. You know what I mean? Like No. And like, honest to God, my favorite, like I said in the beginning, my favorite times in my life, like I remember this one shift and we, my friend Callum was there. Was, he's my friend, was my worker as well. But like, mm. love Callum. Shout out to Callum. Um, he's making coffees. There's a line down to the freaking tree. It's like two in the morning on a Saturday. We're at Northbridge. There's two kids next to me. They're pumping out pretzels. I'm the only bitch rolling things. And I'm like rolling and it's sweaty. It's hot. I'm about to cry. But I'm like that, you know, that song all time low by like, uh, I will not sing it for you. But okay. Sorry. I'll Google it. <laughs> <laughs> it's by a guy called John Bellion. I'd probably and not if I heard it, I reckon. You would. You okay. would. It's a radio song. And it was like playing and it's it's such a catchy beat, right? But it's like all time low. And I like just remember like looking out at everything and I was having a shit time. Like it was two in the morning. It was really busy. And I remember being like, fuck, this is awful. Like, fuck, this is great. Like, this is so good. Like, I'm so proud of myself. Like, yeah. I'm here. I'm doing it. I'm 23. I didn't fucking know what I was doing at all. And I learned. And I grafted and I worked and I'm still grafting and I'm still working. It's still two in the morning or whatever it is. But like the pressure instead of being like crippling was like, so I was so proud. I was yeah. like, look at, you. look at you being in this position where you could actually feel this much pressure. Like pressure is a blessing. Cause it means people like care about you and your work. Right. And like, you know, like uh, I have anxiety. It's like, no, no, just nervous, normal. Mm -hmm. I am depressed. No, no, maybe I'm just a bit sad. But then honestly, you know, like you don't want to be like, you know, it's bad of me to say those things and like really devalue the actual meaning of mm. those terms and words. So it's like, it's complicated and I can sit here in my little chair and make all of the, you know, third world assumptions that I want. But mm. it's like, I've never been so proud of or really appreciated any period of my life more than that that really fucking difficult one like where I was like had anxiety through the roof 24 7 barely slept barely ate was working all the time like my feet my poor feet you know it was like insanity like insanity I was crying more often than anything else yeah but I'm so incredibly like I look back on it and it's like wow that was fun yeah it was not, it was not fun but I'm it was fun I don't know how to describe it it was like good it was so good and it's like, would you do it again? Maybe not. But are you glad that you've done it? Hell yeah. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm very conscious of your time. So. Um, no, you're fine. Don't stress it. Um. Oh, one thing I, will, I do want to ask about. So you got pretzel, but then also chubby boy breakfast bar and voodoo. So how do you go managing different brands as well? Or what? Yeah. I have another one as well. So voodoo has two. So it's okay. voodoo cafe in the city and then voodoo priestess, oh, which is in um Karina. Mm. And um, I go... Not well, not well managing all, <laughs> like, to be honest, really, I'm at the moment, like, regutting some of my stores and, like, starting them up again from mm. scratch, sort of. Um, the stores do really well. I mean, they're great brands. Um, they're super beautiful and they're super fun. But it's, you know, like, recently I've had to learn maybe that, like, 
I take on a lot of people that I want to help mm. and I want to support and I love a great attitude and I want to be this like, you know, I want to stack up to all of the fucking shit I talk where I'm like, you know, people should be better, la, la, la. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, it did lead to like often I would be relying on people um, who don't have the experience mm. and I want to help them, but there are only so many hours of my day. And then I would reduce my ability to be helpful because I'm trying to to do everyone else's job and I'm trying to train them but you know then also stuff gets difficult for them because they can't get in contact with me because I'm contacting so many people then they you know feel silly because they feel like they can't do their job but they're relying on me to train them and it goes around 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 in circles so um you know I've learned now it's like okay we actually have to find the people who can support themselves and others and Mm. reduce that time spend so that I can you know, actually work because a lot of the time I'm like, you know, I want to be like where my staff are. And I'm always like, you know, I don't visit stores. Like I never visit the stores ever. It's kind of like a funny thing Um, with the staff in them. I visit yeah. them a lot, but at like two in the morning. So like uh... they don't see me Um, because I freak them out. Everyone starts like doing weird stuff. They're like doing things wrong. And like, I'm like, guys, just relax. Just it's fine. Do the normal thing. Honestly. Um, so like, you know, managing all of that and trying to put it all together, like there's 15 stores and four brands. It's a fuck ton of work. And I am a micromanager of note. I'm like the shittiest boss sometimes. Like I will send someone on an errand and I'm like, okay, but you go here and then you go do this and park in this car park. Like it's stupid. Like, yeah, but everyone forgets that like we're also like on our own journeys especially when you're my age like I get congratulated so often for being so young I'm like god but also bit of an idiot like (laughs) you know what I mean I'm not not the oracle of all information and I'm learning too and it's just because you're in a CEO role or whatever the fuck doesn't mean you've got everything all together like Mm. policemen don't always make the right decisions doctors don't always diagnose the right way or we're people. We're also people. Yeah. So it's a learning journey for me too. And I think like I'm finally sort of getting on top of it where I'm like, these are logical decisions and mm. we're making good choices. Like I always say to my staff, I'm like, my job is to do what is good for the gander. Like I make the best decision for the most good for the most amount of people. Mm-hmm. Will I please everyone? Absolutely fucking lutely not. But I will always pick the option that will do the most good for the most amount of people. So that's what I'm trying to do now. Like instead of focusing on really helping one person to progress, yeah, yeah. let's let's think about everyone in general and maybe hiring someone who's more experienced, but you know, doesn't maybe get this wonderful opportunity. It's better to give more opportunities to those below them. I appreciate your honesty there. That's really cool because it's not something you say often as well. So, yeah. It's funny that you mention that and like you call it honest, right? Because I have this theory that like people in my position, CEOs, right? We, I'm not a CEO because there's no board. We're not publicly listed, but you get the, the, yeah. the idea. Um, We like, we're a particular type of person always. And you have to have like a particular set of skills or traits in order to want to do this. It's a full on job. You do not get spare time, thoughts, moments, none of that. You're always working. Yeah. But a big fat part of that like personality is this inability to to purport weakness, right? Quote, unquote, weakness. Mm. So often we are asking from our staff for this like, like so many CEOs will tell you the same thing. It's like they just don't understand and like, I just need, you know, like I made a mistake or I've done this or I've done that. And like, no one understands, no one understands, no one understands. But then they'll go out in public and speak about how great it is to be a CEO. Mm -hmm. Like, I make my own hours and I do what I want and it's awesome. But then you're asking your staff to to relate to you because you are just a person. But then we act like we're not just a person. We're like these elite over the, yeah, right? And you're like actually not that elite, not that elite at all. Um, we just, you know, like we're work, we're workforces and and we love what we do. Generally, you will not be in this position if you do not, um, you know, but like, we also hate what we do and we're just kind of like keeping it together. And then, you know, we go on social media and flash a Lamborghini yeah, yeah. and make ourselves so unrelatable. And then, you know, on the other hand, be like, boo-hoo, why is no one relating to me? I'm a person too. 
So I, I really promote in my own little brain, like people who speak about how difficult the job is, mm. not how superior you get to be, but how difficult it is and how emotionally draining it is. And like, not to say that it's not great, but you know, a lot of them also will rampage online and speak about how awesome it is and how anyone can do it and da, 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 da. And it's a lot of misinformation. It's, 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 I would rather be enlisted. I have yeah. spoken to actual military people and their lives in the SAS seem more relaxed than mine. So and it's all regimented for you. Exactly. So it's like, you know, about creating that awareness around like, Bit like you know, there's such an uptake at the moment of everyone being like wanting to be their own boss and stuff like that. And you know, everyone's always like, Oh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start their own business? And I'm like, Great question. I would advise you to double fucking triple check that you want to do this. Yeah, because if the first I always say, I'm like, If the first thing you envisioned was your office and what that would look like, try again, yeah. go sign up for something else. Um, not because you're an awful person or, or anything like that or not because you're not capable, um, but because you want to be near business, you don't want to own it. Mm. You do not have to own the fucking business. You know, that's so rude. I'm swearing. You don't have <laughs> no, to no, own no. It. <laughs> you don't have to own it to, to experience being a part of a business. You know what I mean? And maybe you want to be a CMO or a CFO or, you know, see whatever O or there are so many ways to be close to business. Like maybe you're more interested in PR, marketing, social. Like why is it that you want to own the business? Because hmm. the first 10 things you consider is how fucking hard it's going to be and the sacrifices you're going to need to make, then you're in the right place. You're, you're in the right place. Like that's, that's where you got to be. Because if you're not in that headspace where you're like, I believe in this thing so much that I'm willing to unalive myself over it, mm. not realistically, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then you're, you're just not going to be, you're not going to, you might be successful, but you won't be happy. And then the minute you're not happy doing it, business goes under. Cooked, cooked it. Yeah, it's such a big oh. thing. Same thing with a podcast. I'm like, yeah, podcasts are great. Everyone should have one. But if you're not willing to do the work of the editing, all the crap like that goes on the other side of it, it's like. No. And no one's like, hey, I'm a successful podcast owner and this is the seven and a half hours it takes me to edit. Look at this on social media. Yep. They're like, I'm out here doing this, speaking to this person. And like, but you know, we all do that at social media. We all spend a lot of time curating the good, you know, omitting the bad. Yeah. But we, sh we have this shared collective knowledge and it's like CEOs only have fun and have Lamborghinis. Podcasts are only for meeting famous people and it's that real fun job and you know, you're like, what? Yeah, it's so, kind of annoying. It's fucking annoying. I'm like, no, I do annoying. everything. Because people's like, oh, can you send this off to your editor or send this off to your... I was like, no, it's me. I do everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then people also like, oh, I don't want a nine-to-fiver. I never want to be in a nine-to-fiver. Why would I want to be a nine-to-fiver? You're like, fuck me, though. How good would a nine-to-five be? Yeah. Like, I, what you mean? I rock up at nine, I have lunch, and then I leave at five? Yeah. I don't take work home with me? Amazing. But there's what is this no mythical one place? Home? Honestly, but there's no one online who's like, hello, and welcome to my fabulous nine to fiver. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get cute breakfasts. I have this really nice desk. I, you know, it's got my name on it. I'm living my best life on the weekends. I sleep in. Yeah. I do whatever I want. But no one. Business one's club. Yeah, it's not good content. So, you know, then our shared collective knowledge becomes a little silly. And when, you know, our generation under our generation only learns from TikTok and Instagram. Mm their experience of those things is warped. Yeah. And like one strange thing, maybe it's something for you, asking people for money is fucking hard too. Like I thought mm. it'd be a bit easy now, like asking for sponsorships or I don't know. No, yeah. never gets easier. Honestly, never does. Um, even when you're in my position, you know what happened to me though is like I got into a position where people were clearly taking advantage so they, because they knew like that I was like the pretzel brand. So like, oh, she's got money, quote unquote, mm. kind of thought. But I'm like, I'm still a business person, babes. I will be the tightest asshole you've seen. That's my yeah. job. That's physically in my job description, tight ass. <laughs> uh, but like, otherwise, how do you get through COVID? If I wasn't such a tight ass, we wouldn't be here. Exactly. So, and I mean, I don't drive a Lamborghini. I can tell you that one. But um, <laughs> all my money goes back into more pretzels. Yeah. But uh, it's like, I forgot what I was saying. What was my point? Um, we'll just say, oh, <laughs> 
Pretzel pudding. Yeah, it's oh, social asking media. For asking for asking money. For asking for money. People want, asking for money, yes. Yeah, so then they would be like, send me this invoice or whatever. And they'd be like, okay, this is the quote. This is how much it is. And I would be like, attach my ego to it. Mm. I'd be like, oh, no. So now if I'm like, oh, um, realistically speaking, $4,000 for something that I know is 400 bucks is a little crazy. Mm. I would say, sorry, we've gone with someone else. And then I'd go and use like my personal email to go and find someone else because I didn't want to say back like, hey, babes, that's crazy that, you know, I don't want people to think that we were like cheap or say shit online that we don't want to pay or, you know what I mean? Like, oh, she doesn't do this or, you know, she doesn't value our job because she didn't want to pay $4,000 for something that should be 400. And you think like in circles like that. So the whole money thing never gets easier. It never does. No, I'm still working it out because yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Thank God for email though, because that little bit of like, I mean, it's definitely not as good of a go. It isn't like you will convert more asking for sponsorship over a phone for sure. Mm. But it does really help that little buffer where you're like, Whoop, I don't know if I can necessarily be laying my whole, like I'm not coming to a meeting naked. That's what that feels like. <laughs> yeah. And like, I don't know, you went, especially when you're new to it, you don't know how much things are meant to charge or cost. Like no. if someone asked me 50 bucks, I probably would have taken it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You're like, that is a decent oh, meal out. I'll have it. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, it's a funny one, but oh, you live and you learn. Yeah, and it's tough to know, like, if that's valuable or devaluing you or, you know, but then also should you just be getting your foot in the door? Should you just be like, you know, because there's a lot of people out there who have already made it in, in a particular industry, um, photography, for example. And they're like, you should be charging this amount of money per shoot. And if you don't, you're devaluing the industry because obviously mm. they're pissed because they're charging a thousand bucks and you're, you know, skating in there, taking the work for 500 but you're also like, but babes, if we both charge a thousand dollars, you're gonna get it, not me. The established, yeah. So supply and demand. But then you're also like, fuck, I don't want to be signing up for an industry where now I'm charging five hundred, and then little Sally Lucy comes and she's charging two fifty, and I'm investing all of my time and efforts and life into a saturated. So you know what I mean? Oh, it gets very complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I've got, a, I'm lucky. I've got a few creative friends, so I can sort of ask them and pick their brains. Just even ballpark figures help because some ballpark yeah. figures are wildly different. But um, yeah, for you and your work, do you have any mentors or people you look towards or stories or I don't know? Yeah. Look, I mean, I would love, I would love that. Um, but I do not know. Uh, I pretty much do everything on my own because I'm like a little bit, I'm a little bit wired that way. But I'm working on it. I would like this to be more of a collaborative experience. Um, but yeah, I just haven't found anyone who's like my vibe. Yeah. Cool. And my vibe is like very much like, you know, ADHD, jelly beans in a can. Like, I like the vibe. Yeah. I like the vibe. So, a lot to handle though. Like most people, like my friends go home and take a nap after they spend <laughs> too much time with me. So like, it's a little, like it's intense. Um, and I'm so, you know, when you're young, you have this like wonderful arrogance mm. that it's stupid, but also it's survival. Like fun fact, your brain is not fully formed until you are 25. Um, and so like having that little brief period of time where I'm like, fuck it. I know everything. I know everything. It happens when kids are 19. I'll tell you this. It's called the terrible 19s. I coined that phrase. (laughs) I want kids who are fucking angels. They'll be so good. They're so wonderful. So perfect. 18. Love it. 19 fucking knows everything. Knows everything. Knows your job. Knows the job of the guy next door, the prime minister. You know, he's an underwater welder now. He can do anything. Like he's, (laughs) I've got it. And I'm like, it's just the worst, but also it's such like a valuable sort of like space of time. Mm. You're like, fuck it, I can do everything. Won't so, take no for an answer. Right. But then, you know, when you're like trying to have a mentor or whatever, I'm like, nah, you're too old to understand what I'm trying to do. Like, <laughs> Or you just don't appreciate, you don't appreciate the mentorship. Um, and, you know, and then from my perspective, I'm like, let's not waste people's valuable time so that they can, you know, waste, you know, their day speaking to a jelly can, jelly beans in a can kind of gal. <laughs> Um, but I think as I'm going forward, it's definitely something I'm looking for or like open to. Um, but yeah, just not find the right person, I suppose. So yeah. if you're the right person and you're out there, hello. Yeah, reach out. Because <laughs> it's hard, yeah, because you can't force it out. You sort of just come across naturally and then before you know it, then you are sort of mentors yeah. and mentees, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, again, like you notice, like I don't have social media, I'm not online, like, you know, because I'm fucking working all the time. Yeah. Uh, I don't have time. I don't have time for all of this, you know, schmoozy doozy, 
I'm going to go and find, so I'm not generally in a place where um, there are other people who do what I do, but I went to the QSR Media Awards this year, actually, because I, I won one of the awards, which was super cool. So that, and, congrats, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, and they were like, it was really interesting because coming from Perth, very rare that you're ever in a room of people who do what I do, mm. like just isn't. But over there, it was like so crazy, interesting. Like the like the chai time people are there, and you know, like you freaking name Harry Jacks, KFC, all like you know Zambros, and they have their teams, and like like when you speak, they relate, and you're like, whoa, interesting. It's like that was super cool, and like you know, I had such a fun day, and I didn't realize how much I think as a sole owner, I like miss out on a lot. Yeah. Um, and I don't really have people who are like, you know, even my friends, we go out and they're like, oh, my boss is being a dickhead. I'm like, oh, yeah, mine's awful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't really have that, like, you know, like sort of confiding -y bit or like, yeah. you want to be a dickhead. And you're like, fuck, these kids are annoying the shit out of me. Like, <laughs> I love my children, but they can be very annoying. Oh, yeah, that uh, happens. Yeah, but like no one relates. Because yeah. you're like, whom do I call even to just be like, let's have a little rant about how 19 year olds fucking know everything now. Yeah. So oh. I suppose like mentorship less important to me, but like then someone who would be a mentor who can relate to, yeah. to what happens and what goes on. Yeah. Okay. So very conscious of your time. So last question, but curious mm -hmm. on your thoughts, just Perth blessing or a curse. Cause blessing or a curse. Sorry. It's Cause yeah, sometimes it's like we're so secluded and it's great because I can switch off and do my own thing and not be uh, peer pressured or whatever. You know what I mean? Whereas like sometimes when you went to the QSR awards, there's all these people there and you're like, wow, there's so many ideas, so much energy around. And you get mm. a bit of, I don't know. How do you find it? Um, if I could wear a sandwich board for the rest of my life that says Perth is the greatest city that has ever existed on the back and the front, I would do it. I yeah. love this place. Um, and like, no shade to Melbourne whatsoever, but, um, you know, like m moving the stores over there, the expectation was like this wonderful, beautiful land of free, amazing, interesting thinking people, da, 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 da. And yeah, sure. Found it for sure. But it's not to the extent to which it is promised. Um, and that was like, not a bad thing, but it was such a learning curve. It was like, you don't know what you got till you are like, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, and people constantly ask me, why don't you live in Melbourne? Why on earth would you not be in Melbourne? And I'm like, Perth rocks. It's the best. I love it here. And yes, it can be boring, but it is also super exciting if you know where to look. Exactly. And the community is so beautiful and so small. And like, we all know each other here. And when something exciting does come here or happen, you get this like big fish in a little pond moment. So you're like, fuck, there is a big fish arriving. And there's only like two and a half other medium sized fishes. I am one of them. So you get the benefit of being near the big fish, if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas like in Melbourne, you can be a big fish, but trust me, there's a bigger one and then there's a shark to come. So, you know, you're always constantly fighting to like, mm. you never get this like stop, stand still, experience what you're experiencing moment. And you get a whole lot less collaboration. And like, they work very hard to niche over there. Like they've got like groups of people who do this and groups of people who do that it's so necessary like if you want any community you really do have to like delve straight into like almost a stereotype mm. like i love this this is who i hang out with because i love this but perth is more open to letting you love things and like multiple things and be a part of lots of little communities and be very important in those communities and also important in other ones like it's just such a great incubator i think is like the best word to describe it, you know? And then if I lived in New York city and was traveling to, to Melbourne and I'd be like, Oh, cool. Whereas when you live in Perth and you travel to, I, I don't know anywhere else. You're like, Fuck. Holy shit. Exactly. Everything's I, the poor people who listen to this, their ears are going to like blare out. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that plays with kids in the car, but it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like so much more fun. Like it's, I think it's great to like be here, be based here, know what we do though. Like know about Perth. Don't be mad. Don't be mad when we're a bit boring. Yeah. Roll That's with some it. Some of the fun. Chill out. Exactly. And also, you know what I find is that we are so not worried. And I love that about us. Like there isn't this like, you know, existential need to be driving a Porsche or a Lamborghini. Maybe you should reach out to them for sponsorship because I have dropped the word Lamborghini so many times. <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe they should be paying me. Yes. Um, I'll send him an email or rock up to their offices <laughs> naked. I'm not sure. Just get on the blower. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like there's so, so many good things to being like not worried all the time. Like yeah. I can focus on my job. You know, actually, side tangent, but I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and I said, oh, one of my kids was talking to me about Steve Jobs and like his, um, you know, how he wore the same outfit. Like, yeah. Um, And they were like, oh yeah, because like yours is like, I wear every single day of my fucking life a baggy t-shirt and shorts. If it is winter, <laughs> I wear a baggy t-shirt and jeans. Like yeah. it's the same thing <laughs> on repeat. Um, and they were like, because yours is like a baggy t-shirt and jeans. I was like, what? They're like, yeah, you wear like the same outfit every day. I'm like, no, no, I wear a different shirt every day. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, no, no, but it's the same type of shirt every day and the same type of jeans or shorts every day. And I was like, yeah, it's fucking practical. Why? I don't have time to think about it. And they're like, exactly. Steve Jobs. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm following. I'm getting it. But like in Melbourne, no way. Wouldn't fly. I'd be rude for not coming to my meeting, looking cute. I'd be less impressive or, you know, what it is. Cause they're worried. Like mm. the not worried. I rock up to a meeting most of the time. They're like, is your boss coming? And I'm like, that's me. Sorry. I am actually the boss. Yeah, but I know I dress like a homeless person. It's fine. Just let's get going. Yeah, let's get to the fucking brass tax of it. And they're like, cool. Yeah, no stress. Moving on with our lives. Like, yeah, Perth is just not worried. And I think that like, it's a great place to grow up. It's a great place to incubate. It's a great place to be. And I'm so grateful that I never went to Melbourne or Sydney to go work over there. I think it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have turned out as fun and exciting for me as it, as it is it has and it does in Perth. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Plus our beaches slap. Our beaches are much better oh. than all of the beaches, including, I went to Thousand Mile, you know, Thousand Mile Beach in the Whitsunday Islands. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one that like Jack Sparrow's running down. Yes. Yeah. Ah, uh-uh. Perth beaches are better. Same thing going to Thailand. It's like Thailand beaches. It's like, yeah, it's cool, but Perth yeah. beaches. I'm from Perth. You get it yeah, to yourself. That's, that's- that's the New York effect, right? Where I'm like, every city is just, just must be compelling in comparison. Whereas I cannot travel to a beach and appreciate it. Cause I'm like, fuck, they're just better where I come from. Yeah. I'm still, still looking, but yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think maybe the French Riviera with the, they've got pebbles. This is so completely unrelated. They're yeah. fucking rocks. So like I went in the water, couldn't get out the water because <laughs> the rocks are like turning. Like how <laughs> What? <laughs> what are these rocks? What's where's the sand? Literally, but I, it was kind of cool. It was a cool experience. But yeah, you you have like everyone's wearing little shoes, and I should have clocked it then. Be uh, like, why is everyone wearing little shoes? Barefoot um, bandit. Yeah, and then you can't because these stones are so sh- polished because they've been like rolling around in the in the tide break. Yeah, you're just like, running up a little rolling hill and a hill that never ends. The rocks. Literally, and they watch you like because they know they're like tourists. Uh, yeah. She's got her little shoes. <laughs> Why didn't someone put that in the pamphlet when I came here? <laughs> oh my god, that is so funny. That old chestnut. <laughs> Gotta get those marine booties. But, um, yeah, yeah, honestly, next time we'll not. You will catch me in wherever I was, Monte Carlo or whatever. Yeah. That. Yep. Everyone's looking fancy. Not me. Got my little shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it. But for, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Anything no, else you want to no. add or plug or? No, no. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. Cool. Oh, well.